Hi guys, welcome back to Lunatic Astrology. I'm your astrologer, Lori Lothi, and today we're talking with my fellow astrologer, Alex Stein, who is an archetypal astrologer, about the Saturn and Uranus square coming up in December, the third of three squares going through 22 and we're going to learn a bit about what it might mean for the world at large especially when it comes to things like war rebellion conflict etc looking at the historical storyline as well so i'm just about to let him into the room so let me go ahead and do that so now i have alex here with me in the zoom room recording and i'm going to ask him to tell us a little bit about his astrology style how he got to be an astrologer in archetypal astrology and where we can find him and then we'll go ahead and talk about this incre incredible square last square of saturn and uranus welcome welcome alex hi hi good to be here uh yeah so i practice archetypal astrology and the way that i came to archetypal astrology i guess i've always kind of had an archetypal bent just a, just a way of uh, uh, approaching the world this way like i always really uh even as a little kid like loved metaphors and loved analogies and comparing one side of the universe to the other side of the universe and things that don't necessarily seem related finding the relationships between them and i feel like when i discovered archetypal astrology particularly because that was my my way into astrology was um, reading Cosmos and Psyche by Rick Tarnas. Uh, when, when I discovered that, I was like, oh my God, like here's this, this like language that works like clockwork to, to reveal all of these hidden connections between things. And, um, you know, and then I, I've, I've studied a lot of different styles of astrology and angles on astrology. And I, I keep coming back to archetypal astrology because I like well, A, you know, the advantage that it has is that you avoid the whole um, question of which house system is better. And, and, you know, I know like people have very strong feelings on the house systems, but my personal uh, uh, experience with different house systems is I've always been able to make them work no matter which one I'm using. So I'm like, hmm. And then there's the whole question of the two zodiacs between Indian and Western astrology. And it's like people, people find things that work either way. And so I've just liked the, the fact that this is this commonality between all systems. And I don't let it close me down to any uh, other style of astrology that, that might have something to offer, like Hellenistic or uh, Jyotish or, or whatever. Um, I think that ultimately what I'm interested in in using astrology for is kind of penetrating deeper into the layers of consciousness that we inhabit. And so um, archetypal astrology has been great for that because it's, it's simple enough to it's simple enough technically to look, to allow you to go really deep with, uh, with the symbolism and um, not that you can't do that any other way, but for me personally, uh, I like to be able to just kind of bore in with the planets and their aspects and then use the signs and houses as, as I see fit and um, use it as a way of supporting a kind of growing of awareness and awakening process. So that's, that's my, my bag. Okay, cool. So yeah, I mean, I do get the, so for those of you listening who don't know a bit about archetypal astrology, it's really, first of all, primarily based on the aspectual relationships or angular relationships between planets and the heavens. And it tends to look at the big broad stories uh, throughout time, at least in terms of the book Cosmos and Psyche, which was kind of a pioneering look at how the rhythm of the sky played out in world events. And um, what I think what you're saying too has got some validity. There's so many different house systems that you get dizzy with them. You're not too sure which one to use in terms of predictive value for yourself or for the world at large. Um, coming yeah. from a Hellenistic perspective though, and a whole sign zealotry, I do find that I can make sense of the world and my chart using whole sign houses, but we, yeah. we will not go down that rabbit hole. So we're going to talk today about the sky. <laughs> All good. Yeah, we won't. Uh, we'll go into the sky story. It is really windy here, really crazy. And so every now and then um, I like let it get a gust of wind and, it, and it's like crazy. So I'm, I love that we're talking about Uranus, like literally, and you know, this energy of the unpredictable, the rebellious, the um, disruptive energy of the sky god Uranus, as he is in conflict or in a square, which is an angular uh, conflictual nature of Mars and Hellenistic astrology relationship to each other because squares are the nature of Mars, which is of course, we know what Mars is, the god of war, the god of combat. And with Mars being um, 
oh sorry saturn oh my god i forgot what we were doing that was my last <laughs> video sorry it's back to the square one saturn yeah. the god of the structure the discipline and the organization in a square relationship to uranus does have the element of combat underneath the surface because squares are martian so um and you know saturn wanting to have the status quo sort of stabilized at all costs or to uh, have things that endure become like edifices the predisposition i think of saturn for that wanting to create durable lasting things and if it works if it is, if saturn would maybe say if it's not broken don't fix it you know, there's not a there's not a lot of commonality between the two. So let let's let's just say this for the collective here: February, June, and December. In this case, December twenty fourth is a third square in the sky in two thousand and twenty one, and there'll be a light square October of twenty two. It's not quite total, so just finishing up business in the end of next year, where we've been yeah. going through this incredible crucible of tension between two sky gods: the big sky god Uranus and his son Kronos. And the two of them certainly didn't get along. It's about overthrow of, of dynasties, overthrow of legacies, overthrow of orders that existed. So, you know, there is that vibration of rebellion and revolution in the sky right now. Um, so tell us a little bit about what you're thinking about this year uh, in terms of some of what this overarching theme is and what December 24th may be heralding. Yeah, um, well, so, so first of all, in archetypal astrology, the the approach that we take with the aspects is maybe a little bit different than than how you approach it in Hellenistic astrology. Like we take a wider orb. So for square uh, for world transit, we take ten degrees, and any time the planets are within those ten degrees, um, it's considered to be active. Of course, more more potent when it's closer, but. Um, but also feeling that that we really get the big like walloping things with this transit when some other planet comes along to trigger it, like Mars, say. Um, but so so I've seen Saturn Uranus like like really solidly active all year um, because it, since they've been within that that ten degree orb, and um, uh, I would say that though they have almost nothing in common, what they do have in common is a very kind of strong insistency on their position you know um uh, saturn believes or, or, okay now i'm going to personify the planets all right but <laughs> just for the sake of talking more easily saturn believes in the reality of things you know this is real this is you know this is that and not that and um and it wants to preserve whatever it believes is real and whatever has you know the momentum of the past behind it, etc. Uranus, opposite energy. It's like where where Saturn's wanting to hold on, Uranus is wanting change, uh, but it's just as insistent on the position. It's like if we could cast them as two characters, you know, one would be like, you, you know, the old king, and the other would be like would be the rebel, and and both would just not be able to see eye to eye, right? And so like qualities that you get generally with with saturn uranus i i think i like to think about aspects almost like um like musical chords okay so so like each planet is the note of a chord and each just like in music each note sounds the way that it does right um individually you put them together both notes are still there but then something else is there as well right so uh saturn we have the qualities of Saturn, you know, rigidity, stuckness, resistance. We have the qualities of Uranus, uh, kind of sharp, insistent, sudden, you know, erratic, eccentric kind of kind of energy, uh, kind of electric energy. We put them together, and then the kind of atmosphere that we get from this, like almost if you were listening to some music right the atmosphere that you get from it is like one of extreme tension and extreme uh, only kind of jagged uh like vibrating kind of a quality that's like it, it, it's like a very very tense cord waiting to snap right 
and it reminds me of like cathartic music too you know like like Alanis Morissette you know isn't it ironic which everyone who had a you know really really bad breakup would like sing to heal themselves you know what I mean totally so staccato energy it's staccato in fact Gabriel uh, Roth in the five rhythms practice has like the five rhythms of of music or sound and to which life moves as well and staccato is one of them and I find that mm. this tension we felt all year long this push and pull this tug and war tug of war even between various uh, irreconcilable differences like the vaxxers and the anti-vaxxers you know the, the the lack of partisan bipartisanship right the democrats in the united states versus the republicans I mean there's this kind of like there is no common ground there isn't there's no yeah. to meet in the middle yeah yeah ab absolutely and you, you know, I, I think a thing with Saturn generally, Saturn brings duality, right? Saturn is the, the planet uh, of the 3D, right? The planet of this world is kind of the outer limits of the, the visible solar system, right? Um, anything affected by Saturn tends to just, we, we see pairs of opposites, like Saturn brings the pairs of opposites, right? And so Saturn, interestingly, like forms a kind of polarity relationship with a lot of other planets. <laughs> it's like Saturn and Jupiter, Saturn and Neptune, Saturn and Uranus, they, they, they're all kind of opposites in different ways, right? Um, Saturn and Uranus, like we've already talked about uh, a lot about the opposites that they are. Um, but uh, I find that an interesting way that it, that it works is that it's not just the extreme polarization that it gives you, because th that's there for sure. I mean, uh, the, and, and I see it in a huge way with the vaxxers versus the anti-vaxxers, and we can kind of bore into that a little bit deeper too, uh, though I know it's kind of dangerous water <laughs> to swim in, it ruffles feathers. But um, uh Interestingly, you know, the planets inflect one another. So we're going to get Uranian qualities inflected by Saturn, Saturnian qualities inflected by Uranus. So to give an example, like the January 6th insurrection, right? That happened when the square was, I think, within four degrees. Mm -hmm. So it was about a month before the first square. And, um, and, you know, obviously it's a rebellion, right? But it's a rebellion of conservatives, right? It's conservative anarchy. So it's this kind of oxymoron of, of like, you know, we want to bring down the system and family values, yeah, <laughs> you know, and things like that. And, um, and, and it's just this weird kind of, you know, and then the flip side of that would be like um, fas fascistic liberals, right? When like right, the Soviet right. Yeah, so I totally get that. Yeah, it's like like the whole politically correct uh, movement, right? To, to be exactly is so gotten like our cancel culture. That is like the fascist exactly. liberal versus the radically uh, revolutionary conservatives. And I see what you mean by the mashup between the Saturn and the Uranian themes. You know, Uranus is visible when you know where to look for him. That's the irony mm. of that. And both Uranus and Saturn are actually co-rulers of Aquarius in modern astrology yeah. that assigned uh, the same territory to this father-son, you know, uh, energy. Uh, and I find that also fascinating as well. You know, with, with, you know, Uranus in what modern astrologers call his debility or lack of dignity in Taurus, he doesn't like that fixed sign energy and that stubborn, you know, adherence to the, you know, the really real, right? Because it's, it's earth and it's Taurus and it's fixed. And, you know, he's not as supposedly in his comfort zone. And then you've got Saturn over there in Aquarius, completely super comfy in his own domicile. And this is where I like to put the signs in there because Saturn is in dignity and he's in strength in both Capricorn and in Aquarius. And like this energy, meaning we have more um, hypothetically in a Hellenistic tradition, we'd say we have more Saturn has more clout. And so if Saturn was, were to represent, though, as well as uh, what you mentioned, this kind of weird uh, mashup between the, uh, the poles, uh, to represent the traditional status quo as it exists in our world now, just whatever that you want to call that, you know, the um, the the uh, capitalistic corporate corporate run, you know, government system uh, biting, uh, you know, bidding to the highest, uh, you know, lobbyist. What we think is as the exist existing system, and also the same system that brings like people like Jeff Bezos into great wealth, where everybody else is like, you know, 
the one percent has you know the ninety percent. That system is in place, so Saturn must represent that system because that's what we have already. And Uranus would represent what we need to change, like you know we're having cryptocurrency really rising up as a rebellion against this, the traditional yeah. uh, monetary systems, and that's like very Uranus and Taurus. Taurus rules cr uh -huh. currencies, so I feel as well. But like you know, not just this acute thing of this year, next year, the year before where this has built, been building, but to put it into a context of history, because I did go back and look at a bunch of hard aspects again to refresh my mind. Hard meaning, guys, if you're listening, squares and oppositions, well, even conjunctions between these two planets. You're, you're going to see a history of things like the Korean War. Um, you're going to see things like the Arab-Israeli War, the Six-Day War where um, Israel invaded Egypt back in 1967, Korean War in 1951. Um, you've got the um, stock market crash of 1929. Um, so we see this kind of clashing of energies. Oh, and the Manhattan Rebellion was a cool one, 1951 too, where um, the Thai military tried to overthrow the Thai prime minister in it would happen manhattan in the context of a ceremony with the us so rebellion coups overthrows uh wars skirmishes these are all uranian themes and when i tie that in to the fact that we're now marching down this uh path where mars has just been um he's risen into visibility or will be rising into visibility in the sign of scorpio in the month of november after the 22nd according to the 15 degree rule um although he used a 30 degree rule he rules again he rises in um against the star antares and sagittarius so it's like warrior star guys warrior i think between the scorpio rising or the antares rising whichever theological rising of mars you use meaning he shows up as a visible being in the morning in the morning sky because he's invisible right now that is like Mars, the god of combat, rising in dignity in the sign of his power, Scorpio, all right? Or if you take it 30 degrees out, Antares, the warrior star, the royal Persian star. Well, we have this combat of uh, known for war, inciting war square between these two planets, these two gods. And, you know, there are tensions like China wants to take over Taiwan. Yeah. And, and Australia is biting their fingernails what to do because they're the, in proximity. So I wouldn't be surprised if we don't see some kind of uh, everyone saw it coming, but now it's finally here. Global oh. skirmish there that's going to really percolate in the new year, because this story, as you said, with a 10 degree or using archetypal astrology is still very well in play during all of 22. Yeah. So yeah. I just, I just think um, see a war, but I don't, don't know if it's going to be an all out war, 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 but it's going to be something notable. Yeah, exactly. I mean, um, I, you know, I hope it's not going to be an all out, out war, but it, it kind of feels like we're already, you know, the world is already at war. It's like there's the, the cyber war is like a, it's going on constantly. This thing with China could easily, easily blow up. Um, and the stock market, like, I mean, just like the 1929 hard aspect between Saturn and Uranus, which I believe was a square, uh, it was Saturn and Capricorn and Uranus and Aries. And that, um, you know, is very much on the minds of a lot of people who study the markets because we have a highly overinflated, artificially pumped up market post pandemic. Uh, yeah, that's right. And and inflation is is rising a lot now. And then there's that supply shortage. And, you know, I mean, th th this is another thing, you know, all of this stuff is so connected. And I think one of the one of the really big themes of this is the connection between, uh, you know, financial, uh, well, economic system, financial system, climate, like all of this stuff is is related, right. And, um, for example, I think the real reason for the supply shortage right now is that we're just buying too much stuff, right? Like, I, you know, yes, COVID, COVID messed with with the system and everything, but it's really like since since COVID landed, people have been just buying a lot more stuff on, online. And I know just like a like a couple of weeks ago, I ordered something, you know, just one item online, and I was like looking at the tracking, and like I live in Hawaii, and 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 I was just like watching go from from Tennessee to Florida to Houston to San Francisco. And then like, and then it comes to Honolulu and then it comes to Maui. And, and it's like all because I wanted like one little thing and you multiply that by billions all yeah. the time. Yeah. And, and, and then just thinking, you, you know, about the fact that, you know, Saturn, uh, 
in Aquarius squaring Uranus and Taurus and Taurus relating not only to financial systems, economy, um, uh, but also the earth, <laughs> um, you know, the environment, uh, the, the relationship to, you know, Uranus covering technology, Aquarius covering technology, like the, the, all of this stuff, it feels like everything is coming to a head right now, right? And we just lived through the worst climate summer yet, right? I mean, it just keeps getting more and more obvious, uh, more and more real that it's here, that it's arrived. And yet there's this weird, willful, you know, you know, still people doubling down. This is another thing that you get with the Saturn Uranus thing is there's this real kind of digging in, doubling down energy where, where it's just like, how can, how can people be so stupid? <laughs> you know, I mean, absolutely, like. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, when you talk about the, the, the weird climate, but the summer particularly uh, around the world, especially in Canada, we had so many fires, it was record breaking. And, you know, that was when Mars was triggering that Saturn Uranus attention because Mars was moving through Leo during the worst fire season, at least in Canada, we've seen in ages, even in places that don't get fire. So with Mars in Leo opposing Saturn and Aquarius, creating a T-square, right, um, to the whole storyline with Uranus, I mean, then we saw this inflation of the climate crisis, particularly around heat and fire. And it's like, yeah, you know, I kind of feel like, I kind of feel like the bigger story underneath all of this really, you know, has, if if we use the United States as a benchmark kind of thing, because it's going through its Pluto return, and we look at the fact that right now, the Aquarian zone of the US Sibley chart, which is very accurate for predictions, so I use it, um, is the third house. And you just told me a story about ordering things far and wide, you know? But the third mm -hmm. house can be your local hood, right? And what I'm hearing mm -hmm. from a lot of people in their story right now is this desire to localize their lives, to grow gardens together, to uh, find ways to be sustainable in sustainable ecosystems of community. And, you know, if I have to say the way the future may be going, it's going to be moving away from this intense globalization, which has its great merits as in we are one, but not at the economic level, not when we're spending so much money and resources and environmental pollution to transport things so frigging far and wide. Yeah. And, uh, you know, and I feel like, you know, Saturn is digging its heels until March of 2023 in, in the third house of the U.S. chart. Well, it's, you know, working with the intense intensity of Uranus and uh, cross the way over in uh, the sixth house, which is labor forces, by the way, uh, and rebellion of the labor force. Wait to see what happens when people say it's already happened with the pandemic. I'm not doing this drudgery job that I hate anymore. Fuck you. Excuse me. F you. <laughs> You know, the, yeah. call the pandemic was the, the great resignation where people didn't go back to work. They didn't want to. They're going to find That's something right. meaningful in their life. So if, you know, in mundane astrology, six houses, the workforce, Uranus is plowing through the U.S. workforce, how it plays till March of 2000 and, oh, Saturn, sorry, Uranus until 2026. And it, yeah, so we're having this kind of revolutionary energy throughout the workforce, the people yeah. who do work. Yeah. Yeah, I know that that great resignation and it's it's amping up like people really are not going back to work. And and on the one hand, you know, I, I always take this kind of like, you know, uh, you can see it this way, you can see it that way. And and like I while I generally have this, I'd I'd say that I that that I generally kind of like lean maybe one degree uh, uh you know, over the edge into optimism for humanity and belief in our in our uh ability to evolve and awaken and transform and everything. Um, it's, it, it's a very slight tilt in that direction <laughs> because, you, you know, it's like, like, well, on the one hand, yes, you, you know, people are, are kind of going, all right, let's live smaller. Let's live more local or let, you know, I, I don't want to do this drudgery job anymore. I'm, I'm tired of being a wage slave. I'm, I'm you know, tired of being part of the machine. Um, the, the, there's also this the, the reality that uh you know a lot of people kind of just don't want to go back to work because they don't want to go back to work but then they don't really know what else to do and then they can just, uh, kind of sit around and then um or the fact that you know then they're not making money and then uh, like there's crazy poverty and then <laughs> there's like like all kinds of things i generally feel like the way it's going for us to really, really wake up and really change our ways is it's gonna, 
it's going to need to get a lot more painful first. It's going to like, like, um, and, and I don't want to, you know, I don't want to believe that. I don't want to say that, but it's, if you just think about the way people actually are and the way people actually respond to situations, it, like there's a bell curve, right? And, um, you know, most people are not going to get onto the, like, let's live local thing and get off of, you know, you know, off of the Amazon teat unless they have to right? Unless they absolutely have to. And so, and, and, you know, those companies aren't going to change their ways or uh, collapse or, 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 you know, transform into something else unless they have to. Right. But right. This, this so, was, but I, I, I agree. Nobody's going to change unless they have to, <laughs> but you know, something because things are coming down the chute that are so intense, which I think is going to be a huge, huge stock market correction. And I think that mm. what we're going to see is common sense prevail in like the United States is going to go bankrupt. Otherwise, you're going to have to look at taxing the rich. Mm. You're going to have to actually look at Jeff Bezos and Amazon. That's why I thought of that when you were talking about that. Yeah. You know, we're going to still be on the Amazon teat. But I'm like, well, yes, we can be on that Amazon teat. But wouldn't it be good if the teat was actually paying taxes like the everyday person? Right. Well, yeah. So, yeah. so, you know, if we start to tax those vastly wealthy, you know, Bill Gates slash uh, Jeff Bezos, Elon Musk folk, and they actually pay taxes like the rest of the people, then the United States won't go bankrupt. And then the debt, the debt relief issues will be happening. Yeah. Like the government can pay its debt, um, which is insane right now, the U.S. deficit. So there's yeah. that. And then the other thought I had was, you know, back in 1929, 30, when the stock market crashed and we had the same Uranus, Saturn square, why it's similar to now is Uranus was in dignity and Capricorn in power, you know, had strength. Uranus was in Aries, which is just neutral for Uranus. But in the United States chart, you know, Capricorn has established monetary government systems and bureaucracy and, and the capitalist system primarily. Uh, and that in the United States is a 12th house energy. And uh, the Aries zone, no, yeah, 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 that's right. Like, no, yeah, let me think about that. No, 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 sorry. I have to think about the US Sibley chart in my brain. Taurus, Aquarius, don't tell me. Third house is Aquarius. Capricorn, yeah, so sorry. Capricorn is the second house, the monetary house of the United States natal chart, like the earnings, the money, the, you know, the stuff that's coming through. And the fifth house square, where Uranus was sitting back then, is speculation and gaming. And, you know, when you think about that inflated, ex irrational exuberance, our archetype of the 1929 stock market boom, and how it just fell apart because it was like this kind of like everyone was at the casino together drinking too much and bet betting like crazy and then the whole thing popped in the roaring 20s and all of that and then it led to the dirty 30s and that became you know this time of great hardship uh, food supply chain issues the dust bowl in the united states on a great swaths of unemployment and we're soup kitchens, um, people destitute going on trains and stuff, you know, hobos, the time of hobos. Well, you know, we have Uranus back there in Taurus. That was that Dust Bowl food supply chain, hobos, trains, you know, all of that. Um, but this time it's coming from Aquarius Saturn, not Capricorn Saturn. And I think in, underneath that, it's like when you tried to reverse the mashup, you know, the fascist liberals and the, the radical conservatives. I think that because it's Saturn and Aquarius, it is still Aquarian. It is like about the people. Um, it's about the we factor. It's about the greater, the whole, that looking at things from the perspective of the group goodness. It could be very yeah. much possible that what we're seeing is not that typical, you know, it's still a collapse of the existing structure, but the people want to rise with a new story of what it looks like to be successful and also in harmony with the earth Taurus. So I don't know yeah. that crypto is the answer because I'm not like totally knowledgeable enough to say that crypto is a sustainable direction, but it looks yeah. like that's where it's going. It takes the power away from centralized banking systems and yeah. puts the financial power in the hands of the people. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm on board with crypto, you know, I've, okay. I've, I've yeah. gone into that. I've, I've kind of gone into that forest a little bit, <laughs> but you know, just, I, have a, just, I have a bit of ETH, uh, which I staked a wise token, but I, I really wish yeah. I, I literally set up my computer in March of 2020 and looked at yeah. buying a token for like 5,000. <laughs> yeah. A Bitcoin. I mean, I could have, don't even talk to me now about that. Okay. I literally <laughs> okay. And I didn't, but anyway. Yeah. Yeah. Um, oh yeah. I know. Yeah. But 
you know, I think another another part of this, of course, is that the there was the grand conjunction right in at the end of 2020, um, you know, ushering in this new air era. And um, and and I do think that there's a lot of uh, I, I think that with that, like I felt a palpable shift in in the energy as far as uh, a sense that that there is something we, you know, this direction for the people that we are going in and a sense that that new solutions to problems are possible and and may very well be arrived at. Um, and, you, you know, we just it's like we still got to go through the the, the really like jagged uh, collapse <laughs> time, you know, which Saturn Uranus is about. And and I, I like I see everything in terms of in terms of motion, right? And and I do see this generally positive direction that things are headed in, although very, you know, year, years of some pretty intense kind of scary stuff to have to pass through. When it comes to climate, particularly, I mean, uh, one thing that I think Saturn and Uranus uh, really correlate to is uh, sudden collapse. Of, of structures of any kind, right? Saturn representing just structure. So the, uh, the you know the integrity, the structural integrity of things like the climate or the financial system or uh, a person's mind or um, uh, a building. I mean, literally, like like you know during this square, there's been a uh, that condo collapse in Florida, the uh, subway collapse in Mexico City. Uh, there were a ton of, uh, of mass shootings around the time, you know, earlier in the year when Mars was aligned with mm -hmm. Saturn Uranus. And, and the, the common thing in all of those is this sense that someone just snapped, right? So there, there's this, with Saturn Uranus, there can be this kind of like holding, 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 and then boom, the bottom falls out. And, um, you know, that that's happening uh, you know, they're saying that in the Atlantic, there's this current system, I forget what it's called, but it's a current system where, where uh, warm water moves up from the Gulf to the Arctic, and it basically shapes the weather for the entire East Coast. And they're saying, oh, that's starting to look unstable. And if that collapses, like, who knows what's going to happen? And um, you know, so it's this way that on on every level and literally everything, you, you can see the the presence of these energies, right? Whether yeah, it's climate. You know, I um, love your analogy of like the snaps, like the pulling and tension and the snapping, or it could be that the hairline fractures that are already in existence for climate, for the yes, for the I know the ocean current thing. If that changes and it is slowing down, if it stops, we're going to have catastrophic issues also with the food chain because sea animal and sea life depends on that current in terms of the water temperatures. So, you know, yeah. we're looking at that idea, like these fractures that we have that are already there, like cracks in the concrete with that condo, maybe that collapsed in Florida, exactly. are just getting ready to finally show their true face and snap. And, you know, the other thing is, if you think about the archetype of the infrastructure bill in the United States and how that's, you know, just passed, like, let's strengthen our bridges, let's rebuild our roads, right? That's exactly. so exactly Aquarius. But, but the thing is, it's almost like an unconscious need to put a big bandaid on a problem that's so much bigger than your bridges. You sure, know, sure, like, yeah. As, as humanity's psyche is collectively de wrestling with the fact that the earth is yeah. falling apart we're going to build a stronger bridge and a better road. That's not yeah. be the problem, folks. It yeah. may feel good at one level, you know, it may feel like a good yeah. idea, but it's not going to be a solution to what the big issue is. And it's the infrastructure of the earth herself that is needing to be rebuilt or, or supported so it doesn't collapse. <laughs> yes, yeah. And and I mean, I think even even beyond beyond that, like, well, okay, so so I, I can definitely see the Saturn Uranus uh, just archetypal kind of qualities in the infrastructure bill, bill because it's sat, uh, sorry Uranus renewal right of Saturn infrastructure. So, um, so so it's like one possible expression, but yeah, it's it's not the deep um, <laughs> the deep layer thing, and and this is like th this brings up a bigger kind of general sort of philosophical thing I have with astrology. Um, which is that, you know, there's this idea that that Rick Tarnas coined in um, 
uh, Cosmos and Psyche about archetypal multivalence, which is just you know a fancy way of saying uh, these these archetypes, these kind of symbolic fields, uh, have you know an infinite variety of expressions. So so we, we can talk like I just did about like the structural integrity of a person's psyche of a building foundation of an institution whatever and the the question then becomes you know that that does beg the question when we're using astrology for ourselves or with clients or to look at the world like okay how how many layers down can i go with this like like what's the what's the deeper level of consciousness that that this archetype is is a window to or that this archetypal combo is a window to and I, I think that ultimately the Saturn Uranus um, the Saturn Uranus combo. Let me back up a sec. I, I think everything astrologically, ultimately, whether it's it's on the big scale or the small scale, ultimately points to what we each individually can do in ourselves with our own consciousness how much can we awaken and i think that that's the big thing of this time is like a lot of people are starting to uh understand that there's more to them than the stories that that they have identified with uh for their whole lives and interestingly you know really potent archetypal energies really potent uh planetary configurations uh will will rile us up they'll 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 start churning up all these emotions and all these reactions and we just react to things one after another which gets us caught in story after story after story after story and we lose in that way we lose uh, our connection to who we really are but by the same token by following that all the way through and going down the rabbit hole where it leads us we actually can rediscover the the that deeper sense of who we are and so i think with saturn uranus um you know this old old ways of being new ways of being um let's put that that aside for a second it's like we definitely are going into something new but how how do these combine in a in a more meaningful way it's like um uh we could say the lasting change that we want right saturn or something grounded like you know real substantive change um you know a sense of responsibility you know responsibility to others personal integrity you know this is all saturn stuff even as we you know fly to new heights um and yeah so yeah. I kind there's of something else i wanted to say but i'm yeah, I kind of feel like that Uranian energy that is, you know, hitting the collective through the Saturnian lens, you know, uh, as the two of them tango with each other. It, it has given way to people feeling like they've had, well, first of all, just the whole word woke, you know, the whole woke culture. Yeah. You know, Saturn right away. But, you know, people are having these mini epiphanies, these awakenings. Um, they're also having fractured psyches and they're snapping like into like insane conspiracy theories and delusions as well. Um, but but uh, my feeling is where this thing ends up taking us all with Saturn in Aquarius and having been synodically joined by Jupiter, the great conjunction last December 21st, 2020, is that that energy is fresh and new. So, you know, we haven't really had that, that Aquarian synodic joining of Jupiter with Saturn. So now it's, it's like we've toned or seasoned Saturn with that Jupiter conjunction uh, in Aquarius. I think the last one was in the 1400s. And so because of that, this Saturn is still carrying a lot of Jupiter juice around him. And I think Jupiter, uh, honestly, this is crazy, but I think Jupiter Aquarius energy is a lot like Let's find our place in the cosmic brotherhood of the alien alien world. Like I almost feel like <laughs> this is like bad, but I keep saying this. I always knew I was born to live in the time where not only do we know life and other planets existed, but we met it. So yeah. um, I've got to get 30 more years left on the planet. And that synodic conjunction initiates the Aquarian realm for about 20 years till the next conjunction. And it tells me that maybe just maybe one of the things that we could be waking up to and breaking on, break on through to the other side or break down to break through. These are good quotes for Saturn Uranus and that break on through to the other side, you know, is that we're not alone and we're like, we're not 
alone. We're just not alone. I yeah. think humanity has an ex existential, we're all alone crisis. There is no God, yes. <laughs> you know, Nietzsche, yes. nihilism. We're all, we have to do it ourselves. We're all alone. Wouldn't it be kind of cool if there were like in that movie Arrival, some brethren that would show up to help us out from another place in time or another planet, whatever, another dimension, who knows? So yeah. I feel like we could encounter the makers of the crop circles, for goodness sakes. We could discover yeah. There's another intelligence that would like to help us out of our self-made crisis. And if that yes. could happen within the next few years, which it may because of this rare new Aquarian zone that we're living into, um, and with Neptune and Pisces, which he hasn't been doing since the spiritualism movement of the 1850s and 40s, 50s, and 60s, which gives us this whole desire to break through, like spiritualism when Neptune was in Pisces was talking to the dead and rapping on tables and recognizing the mm -hmm. spirits of the dead existed. So Neptune is still there in Pisces while we have this synodic joining of Jupiter and Saturn, which is ushering in something we haven't seen for ages, like the 1400s, if I remember correctly. And it tells me that we're in for something so brand new. And I think I don't think the UFOs will land in the White House lawn and save us, but I think awareness of other dimensional beings or other planetary life forms and a sense of connection to a greater sister and brotherhood of beingness is what we need. Yes. We need yeah, to yeah. a myopic little, you know, because there's a civil war brewing in the United States. That's my Pluto return. Okay. Get ready for that one, guys. Like for the United States, there is a, already a civil war here. How, how yeah. extreme that civil war will be, we, will, we, we shall see. Yeah. Yeah. No, I'm, I'm with you on that. Um, on that opening up to, uh, other levels of intelligence, other beings, other dimensions. I, I really feel like, uh, beginning with the grand conjunction. I mean, I, I felt like a vast shift in, in, in my own inner work and in my own journeys and everything. Uh, I have started kind of having some, some, uh, pretty out there experiences of that sort. And, um, and, you know, my feeling on that whole matter is that it just seems, it, it seems almost like as ridiculous as extraterrestrials seem to a lot of, you know, materialist or rationalist type people. I mean, when you really think about it, it it's, it, it's like, are, are you kidding? Like the universe is so vast and, com and, and like, we, we just have the, the barest little, little scrape of of like light that we can you know that we're looking at from our ordinary level of of awareness it's it's almost preposterous to think that that there wouldn't be other other life forms uh in other dimensions and um and i think part of this this process is waking up to the the fact that the way we can perceive these things is different than how we've imagined it in the past Right, like, like we're learning things about the nature of consciousness now. That and and I think um, larger numbers of people are equipped to now do that. It's like in the past, you know, kind of the, the mysteries have, have had to be kept secret from people uh, by and large, because you know they they open you up to things that if you're not ready for them, like it can be dangerous, or you know they give you power that if you know you're not ready to handle that power, like you you really shouldn't possess it. Um, but now it's it, it's like suddenly more people are are on the level, and um, and no, it's not about uh, necessarily like UFOs coming and landing on the the White House lawn, like you said. It's like we we we're used to thinking of things in very materialistic terms, and. Um, I think we're already uh, we're already multidimensional beings in our awareness, and and asking ourselves, kind of taking stock of how it is that we that we perceive other dimensions uh, is is something that I, I think is brewing right now. Uh, understanding that, you know, I really believe that the arts, that the arts of all kinds, uh, are a kind of multidimensional. Uh, system of perception <laughs> i mean i could get I, I could get really nerdy on that topic but um but but there's all kinds of ways and i think astrology is one of them too i was just um, gonna go there i was gonna say like you know we're seeing like with this new synodic cycle of air that's coming in for 200 years guys if you're listening what i mean is jupiter and um saturn come together in the sky and for the last 200 years except for ingress into libra a tiptoe in they've been coming uh in 
you know, 40 years ago, they've been going in uh, that meetings in the sky in earth science, which is why we had the industrial revolution and why we have our capitalist commercial uh, marketplace, free market system. I mean, it's why we have what we have now. But now we're going into what's the be very beginning of a 200 year cycle in which these two giant planets come together, these two great gods come together, Jupiter, Mount Olympus, God and Saturn in the science of air. And I think that's going to lead us to things that we're already seeing. Like it used to be if you were like, you know, honestly, mainstream astrology has gone mainstream. It, you know, it used to be like, I actually watched a stupid uh, Australian uh, 60 minutes the other day, I had to turn it off about is this, you know, astrology is becoming like, you know, is it real or is it, you know, Memorix? It was so, it was so retro. It was like looking at astrology from the lens of the 1950s as if it was a spooky, really yeah. weird thing. And I'm like, that's not where we're at, Australians. Yeah. It's where like, we've got, like, if you look at my client base, I mean, I've got really important, like real normal people, like who run big yeah. corporations in my business. <laughs> Yeah, and they're looking at how to make business decisions using astrology. So sure. it is not a flaky, wild, and weird and crappy, you know, out there thing full of nutcases. It is a useful tool to navigate reality. How does it work? We don't know how it works. We know that it does work. And you know, somebody said recently that we both know you can't predict death with astrology. Unfortunately, you can. You can, and I do. It's very practical. And I do for clients when they have elderly parents who are ailing or sick or a spouse who's you know been ill, critically ill, and they want to know if there's passing is soon. And I can look at the chart of the client. And from their chart, I can see the likelihood of a pet parent or a spouse passing and the time frames where that is likely to happen. And because it's correct, about 70% of the time, my clients come back to me. So you can use astrology as a predictive tool. And that's why I love mm -hmm. the Hellenistic astrology, because it's got a lot of time lord systems that allow you to refine the prediction. So, yeah. but the point is that where I went with my rant about Hellenistic astrology and it is predictive is that you know what we need is to see is that there are so many ways of perceiving reality that we haven't been able to uh, use or we've been afraid to use or that we haven't known we could use astrology being one lens and yeah. i think this new air age that we're coming into for 200 years and this year particularly intensely because of that square to uranus from the air placement of saturn right is where we're going to see a lot of breakthroughs. So I'm going to finish us up today with the, the thought that I think one of the key things that could happen in the next couple of years while the square is prevailing is a breakthrough technology around energy. And while we're, we're really running the thing to get to electric cars and stuff, electric cars take energy. Uh, we used to we have to make the electricity to charge the car. We have to use the lithium batteries that pollute the earth. We have to you know, like it takes energy to make all energy that we know, including petrol energy and, and gasoline and oil and electric and i feel like where things may go this is my prediction is that by the time we get outside of this energy field of the square and maybe by the time saturn leaves aquarius in march of 23 we may find ourselves blessed with a more of a free energy breakthrough you know like the zero point mm -hmm. field or the quantum foam energy breakthrough or you know totally clean cold fusion i don't know what it is but whatever it is that is, of course, going to collapse reality as well, because all the industries that have been propped up by the current structures, like um, the oil industry, will have a ma major collapse. But I do think that that's what's going to happen. And this particular inventive breakthrough, I'm predicting, will not be suppressed by the forces that be. That's the thing. There have been breakthroughs, but they're always like, let's grab that pen, yeah. let's hide it, let's hide that, because we need to keep the oil industry going. Vested interests yeah. do not want a free energy breakthrough where the cost of making the energy is negligible, right? And so that we're not mm. polluting the earth, you know, that kind of thing. Okay, so your last uh, volley, and we're gonna finish up because we're a little bit past 45 minutes. Okay, sure. Yeah, so, you know, I like to think about how this all uh, points to our own inner journeys and, and where it can be leading us. And I just wanted to say a, a quick thing about the way that I think the nodes have played into this because for the last, you know, almost couple of years, right? The nodes have been in Gemini and Sag, which has really been about perspectives, information, worldview. And during this time, we've gotten so divisive and, and, and people so dug in on their positions and living in these alternate universes. And now as the, the nodes move into um, uh, the South node in Scorpio, North node in Taurus, right? Um, as they move into Scorpio and Taurus, it, it's going to 
drop us down a level into the kind of like lower chakra regions of like our, our sort of deeper traumas and woundings and survival issues. And I think that that as we, if, if we're on the, the path of kind of awakening through this process of this crazy time in the world, and moving into higher levels of consciousness, this is going to be a way that we really drop down and, and start to process through some intense stuff. And I think that the ultimate place where Saturn and Uranus can, can lead us is a kind of freedom from fear. Um, you, you know, we sat, Saturn br uh, brings with it a lot of fear, you know, a sense of our own powerlessness in the face of, of greater uh, forces, uh, other people, uh, all that sort of stuff. Uranus, freedom, of course, but in order to make it work, we have to really get down into our deepest levels and essentially learn to become untriggerable. And I think uh, as we go through really triggering times, if we find ourselves getting to the point where the things that used to trigger us don't trigger us anymore, that to me is the greatest progress humanity can make. And, and it's fr from that point that I don't know how many... Uh, people it's going to take for a critical mass but like for the real changes in the world to occur i feel like that's yeah. what's going to need to happen and that's the direction we're moving in hopefully so i do think we're moving in that direction i wish it would be faster global equity yeah. <laughs> inner peace is here uh it, it, it yeah. i don't think it's the long-term trajectory of the new uh, air 200 year air cycle and yet I think this is not going to be overnight. I don't think there is a hundredth monkey. Yeah. I think that's a great idea. Yeah. And all of a sudden, the last yeah. one more person gets enlightened and the whole of us go into enlightenment. Yeah. Uh, I think it's going to take yeah. longer than that. But I do think I wrote a, I channeled a book called The Coming Age of Miracles when uh, Neptune was on my Mars. Mars was, yeah, yeah, sorry. Neptune, in the transiting Neptune was on my Mars for 2019-20. And I downloaded three books, The Way of Miracles, The Coming Age of Miracles, and the other one which I didn't finish. And one of the key pieces is what you're talking about this global awakening to hear the divine intelligence the voice of that divine intelligence and be in communion with it which leads of course to a whole different world than we have where we feel separate from the divine intelligence whether you call it god source creator or the you know the eternal nature of your own self yeah 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 okay All so right. this is a lot of fun thank you so so much alex for joining us where can people find you i'll have the link in the description box uh your website perhaps sure. Yes, yes, yes. So my website is 21stCenturyAlchemy.com and that's all spelled out. So it's the word 20. And then you can also find me on YouTube at 21st Century Alchemy. That's the number. <laughs> okay. I'll have both and, and also, in the box. Yeah. And also on Medium, 21st Century Alchemy. So Okay, yeah. sweet. We'll have all those links in the description box for people to go find out more about you. Thanks for spending time with me today. I swear it's a earth you know, outside my window. I love that the weather decided to be very you know, Saturn, Uranus, like bolts of like blusters of wind and holy man, you wouldn't believe it. <laughs> I'm looking at my outside window and I'm like, are the trees going to hold up? And so you have a sweet afternoon and uh, let's All right. and do more fun things together. All right. Great. Thank you. Ciao, ciao, Alex. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.